Good morning, and welcome to Summit Church online worship service. We're happy to have you with us today. Starting next Sunday, we will be meeting in person in the sanctuary, and we'll be videotaping that service so that we may show it on the internet later in the day. So be prepared for that. Uh, A few announcements I'd like to share is the funeral for Joanne will be um, on Tuesday at 2 o'clock here in the sanctuary. The visitation will start at 11 and go until 2 with the service at 2. Also, an update on Georgiana. I know many of you have been praying for her. Um, The PET scan showed that she has no cancer anywhere else in her body. So the final step that she has to go through to get approved for surgery would be for the neurosurgeon to clear her from any cancer in the brain. So please keep Georgiana in your prayers. And finally, keep Darlene in your prayers as well. She is hoping to come home this weekend. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Welcome to our time with children and those who are young at heart. So this morning, um, I brought a couple of cans with me uh, that I wanted to share with you. And each one of them says, I can on it. And when we say that we can do something, we have confidence in ourselves. And confidence is a great thing. It's good to be confident uh, and to know that there are certain things that you can do. But as as good as confidence in ourselves is, uh, being confident in God is even better. Having confidence in God is even better. When we put our hopes and our dreams and our wants and our needs in God's hands, uh, he will show us directions to go and adventures to discover uh, that we never would have thought about before. Well, in the Bible, the Apostle Paul was so confident in God that he wrote this verse in the book of Philippians. And it says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now that is some confidence. Well, hmm, I can. I just so happen to have two I can cans. And so we're gonna try a little of an experiment because these two I can cans are like two different lives. They might be you or they might be me. Um, they, they, they're lives that look the same, but they're really different. They're, they're not the same, they're different. Because on the back of this I can can, it says, by myself. And on the back of this one, it says, through Christ. Hmm. Well, let's see what happens to these two different lives when like the pressures of life come on them, when things maybe get hard or we're not We think we can do it, and we're saying, I know I can do it, but I'm going to do it by myself. I can do this myself. Let's see what happens sometimes to our lives when we do things just by ourselves. But I need some help. And since all you guys are probably still in your PJs at home, I'm going to ask 
for my friend, Pastor Tom, to come and help me. So, Pastor Tom, here's our can that's when we're trying things and doing things by ourselves. Okay, so give that a squeeze. See, see what happens when the pressure of life comes on that life. Oh, whoa, he is so strong. Look at that. That is amazing. He just crushed that and sometimes when we try to do things by ourselves, our life gets a little crushed up sometimes. But when we have confidence in Christ, when we have confidence in Jesus, remember the Apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so I have this can that says, I can through Christ. And let's see what happens when life starts squeezing us a little bit. Uh-oh. Whoa, and you all know how strong Pastor Tom is, but he really couldn't squeeze this can. The can stood up pretty well to that pressure. Thank you, sir. The can really stood up to the pressure of being squeezed because this can is saying, I can do all things through Christ. And so we can stand up to our problems in life and those different things. So the same way that you and I have confidence that we can, like Paul, our confidence needs to be in Christ. And when we say, I can do all things through Christ, Jesus gives us the strength and the power to do the things that he asks us to. You know, by God's spirit in us, we have that confidence and the strength to do the things that God asks us to do. Because he's not going to ask us, can we, can we do everything and anything? Like, could um, I jump from here all the way across to the other side of Saxonburg Road? Well, no, I can't do that. And I wouldn't even be able to say, I can do that through Christ. Okay, because that's really kind of silly. But there's a lot of different things that we may say, and if God asks us to do them, if there's different things that God asks us to do, we know that in Christ, he gives us the power to do what he asks us to do. So you and I, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. And I thank you for your spirit that comes and lives inside of us when we trust in Jesus. And I thank you that there are times when you ask us to do things that we're just not quite sure we can do. But when we remember, when we remember the promise that uh, you have made to us and what the Apostle Paul wrote in his word, that we can do the things that you give us the power to do and we can do them through and in you. So thanks for your love for us and the power that you give us to do the things you ask us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the many blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. We give you thanks, dear God, that we know where we are going because we have put our faith and our trust in you. We pray, dear God, for this church family, that you will draw us closer together as the body of Christ, that you will lead and direct us and fill us with your Holy Spirit as we do your will. 
We pray especially now for Joanne's family and pray that you will comfort them during their time of grief. But we also pray, dear God, that you will lift them up with your joy as they celebrate her life and her testimony of your love, grace, and mercy. We continue to pray for Georgiana. We're very thankful for the good report that we received. And we just pray, dear God, that you'll continue to touch her with a healing touch and remind her that you are there. And for Darlene, who is still in the hospital, we just pray, dear God, that she does indeed get to come home this weekend. We pray that you will touch her, too, with your healing touch of grace. And remind all of us that we are loved in Jesus Christ, now and forever. In his name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 10. We're going to begin reading at verse number 9 and read down through the end of the chapter. Listen now to God's word. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart and all these signs were fulfilled that day. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked one another, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man who lived there answered, And who is their father? So it became a saying, Is Saul also among the prophets? After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Now Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, Where have you been? Looking for donkeys, he said. But when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, Well, tell me what Samuel said to you. Saul replied, He assured us that the donkeys had been found. But he did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah. And he said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. And you have said, No, appoint a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by the tribes and by clan. When Samuel had all of Israel come forward by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. So they inquired further of the Lord, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, Yes, but he has hidden himself among the supplies. They ran and they brought him out, and as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among the people. And the people shouted, Long live the king! Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their own homes. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some scoundrels said, How can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. This is the word of the Lord. A woman brought a limp parrot into a veterinary hospital. As she lay her pet on the table, the pet pulled out his stethoscope and listened to the bird's chest. After a moment or two, the vet shook his head sadly and said, I'm so sorry, Polly has passed away. The distressed owner wailed and cried. Are you sure? I mean, you haven't done anything, she cried. You haven't tested him. He might just be in a coma or something. The vet just rolled his eyes, shrugged and turned and left the room. A few moments later, he returned with a beautiful black Labrador. As the bird's owner looked on in amazement, the dog stood up on his hind legs, put his front paws on the examination table and sniffed the dead parrot from top to bottom. He then looked at the vet with sad eyes and shook his head. 
The vet then took the dog out, but returned a few moments later with a cat. The cat jumped up and sniffed the bird as well. The cat sat back, shook his head, meowed, and ran out of the room. The vet looked at the woman and said, I'm sorry, but like I said, your parrot is most definitely 100% certifiably dead. He then turned to his computer terminal, hit a few keys, and produced a bill which he handed to the woman. The parrot's owner, still in shock, took the bill. A hundred and fifty dollars, she shouted. A hundred and fifty dollars just to tell me my bird is dead? The bet shrugged. He said, if you'd taken my word for it, the bill would have only been twenty dollars. But with the lab report and the CAT scan, what did you expect? Sometimes in life, you get a lot less than you expect, especially if you order something from the internet. Sometimes you get more than you expect, and sometimes you get exactly what you expect. If you get more on your tax refund than you were expecting, you will be elated. If you get less on your tax refund than you were expecting, you are going to be highly disappointed. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, there are three different people or groups of people who get a lot more than they expected. But interestingly enough, none of them seem to be elated. The first person to get more than he expected is Saul himself. My favorite Bible teacher when I was in college was a pastor by the name of Warren Wiersbe. He could open up the Bible and make it come to life like no other Bible teacher I'd ever heard before. When Dr. Wearsby talked about this time period, he described it in a way that pretty accurately describes it, but I'm going to disagree with him just a little bit. He called the period of the judges, which we've been talking about leading up to the monarchy, he called this period as the time of no king, and that's very accurate. When David comes to rule, he calls this the period of God's king, and we know David was the man after God's own heart, so that's accurate as well. But describing the reign of Saul, Dr. Wearsby called it the time of man's king. And even though I understand very much how he arrived at that description, I don't 100% agree. I think it's somewhat misleading. Because chapter 10 is going to make it abundantly clear that Saul was chosen by God. In choosing Saul, God does the unexpected. Saul is out chasing donkeys and somehow out on this journey running around the countryside looking for lost donkeys, he ends up being anointed as the very first king of Israel. Nobody is more surprised than Saul. Saul lacked confidence. He had a significant lack of self-esteem. When Saul's uncle asked Saul what the man of God said to him, Saul said, oh, he told us where the donkeys were. But he doesn't utter a single word to his uncle about the fact that Saul had told him he would be the first king of Israel. Saul is still in a state of disbelief and maybe even shock. But pretty soon, Saul is going to be overcome with fear. Later, when Samuel is casting lots, that is, he is giving a visual demonstration to the children of Israel that the king was chosen not by him, but by God, by casting lots. They're trusting in God to oversee this process that it will fall on Samuel, on Saul to be identified as the king. The tribe of Benjamin is selected, and then the tribe of the family of Matri, and finally Saul is chosen, but Saul is nowhere to be found. They ask God where Saul is, and God says he's hiding in the baggage. He's over there somewhere trying to stay away, hiding himself because he is afraid of what is about to occur. When I was thinking about this, I, I started thinking about when I was a, a young man growing up in Kentucky, running around with my friends, oftentimes my friends would want to play basketball. And I knew that I couldn't dribble and I couldn't shoot, and I would be a liability on the basketball court, but they always wanted me to join in and play with them. So I would get on the court and I would play, I would usually play good defense, but then when we had the ball playing on offense, my strategy was very simple. 
I would get behind an opposing player and wherever that player went, I stayed behind him so they wouldn't throw me the ball because I was afraid that if I got the ball, I would either have to dribble or I would have to shoot. Thinking of that kind of reminds me of Saul. He's hiding because he's afraid. He doesn't have any confidence. A number of years ago, I was installing officers on a particular Sunday morning. And I chose for my scripture reading that morning, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 is a description of the qualifications of church officers. And so I used that as my sermon and I talked about what it meant to be a church officer. After the installation was finished and the service was over, one of the elders was walking out of church and that elder shook my hand and looked me right in the eye and said, if you had preached that sermon last week, I never would have agreed to be a church officer. I would have quit right there because I don't think I can do it. And I looked at this person and I said, then you're exactly what we need on session. Because you're going to need to rely upon the strength and the power of God to enable you and use your gifts and abilities to glorify him and to serve the church in this unique way as one of the church's leader. The problem is we too often sell ourselves short, but in reality, we're selling God short. God can work wonders in and through each one of us. Jeremiah, when he was called by God to be a prophet, said, I'm too young, I can't do it. Moses, when he was called by God to go back to Egypt, Moses' response was, I can't speak, I'm slow of tongue, I can't do it. But Paul, as Carol reminded us earlier, said so powerfully, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul understood it is not in our own power, our own strength. It is the power of God that enables us to do what God has called us to do. Saul is very reluctant. So God is going to have to convince Saul that he can do what he has called him to do. After Samuel anoints Saul at the beginning of this chapter... He tells Saul that he is going to receive three separate signs from God. The first sign is he's going to encounter three men who are going to give him two loaves of bread. And that's very important to remember two loaves of bread. The second sign was the spirit of God would come upon him. And the third sign was that he would be changed into a different person. Now, I want to caution you, don't interpret that to mean that that is talking about a conversion experience. It's not. We're going to find out that later about Saul, that his heart never really changes toward the Lord. But what it's talking about in this passage, it's a change of heart on the part of Saul from being the reluctant king to becoming the king who is going to lead the nation of Israel. It is a different determination by Saul, and we're going to see that in chapter 11. Samuel wraps up this prophecy by saying, once these signs are fulfilled... Do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. In other words, as you perform the duties of being a king, God is going to go with you every step of the way, and he is the one who is going to empower you. Verse 9 then says, As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all these signs were fulfilled on that day. It's very important for us to remember that Saul was anointed to be the king of Israel. The word anoint in the Old Testament is from the Hebrew word where we get the word Messiah. And of course, we know that Jesus is the ultimate Messiah. Scripture makes it clear that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would come and he would rule over his people as prophet, priest, and king. It is not an accident that Saul is anointed to be the king, and then he receives two loaves of bread, which according to Leviticus chapter 23, two loaves of bread are a priest portion of a sacrifice that someone was bringing to the house of God to offer to God. They would give the priest two loaves of bread. So God is sending Saul the message that this new office that he is being called to hold is prophet, is priest, as well as king. And thirdly, it is prophet. Because when the Holy Spirit comes upon Saul, he prophesies. 
This is indeed a picture of what kingship should be in Israel. The leader of the nation was to be the prophet, the priest, and the king of the people. And ultimately, it would be Jesus Christ who would be the fulfillment of prophet, priest, and king. Number one, Saul doesn't expect to be anointed as the new king. Number two, the Israelites don't expect Saul to be any kind of a spiritual leader. Notice how they respond to Saul and what happens to Saul. When all those who formerly had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked one another, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And then that same question is asked again in verse 12. Is Saul also among the prophets? To those who heard with their own ears and saw with their own eyes, saw singing and dancing and prophesying, they are totally blown away. Because this is totally out of character for Saul. I can almost imagine kind of what they would say in today's world if this happened. They would be going, I've never even seen him in church. And somebody else says, well, yeah, I saw him in church one time, but he, he was sitting on the back pew and he, he didn't sing the hymns. He didn't participate in the worship service. He, he just kind of sat there and I think he slept through half the service. But here is Saul who's standing up in front of the service with his arms raised. He's prophesying. He's praising God. He is along with these People called the prophets. Saul was obviously not a religious person. We know that from earlier stories where he didn't recognize the spiritual leader of Israel, Samuel, and nor did he seek Samuel's advice. It was the servant that wanted to do that. But yet here he is with this band of what in that day would be considered fanatics. They would be considered holy rollers. They would be considered kind of on the, the fringe of religious society. They're, they're the ones who are so emotional and they're carrying on. And yet God is sending a message. That this is a supernatural movement of the Holy Spirit. God is moving in a way that nobody expects. Just like he did on the day of Pentecost when he empowered the apostles. And they spoke in tongues. And the people heard in their own language. And, and there were those critics standing on the side saying, oh, they're just full of wine. They've gotten drunk. That explains it all. But it wasn't. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is what we have in our own lives today. Matthew chapter 17, Jesus says to his followers, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. And John 14, chapter 12, Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do will do the works that I have been doing and they will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. And when Jesus went with, to the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit to take his place. It is the Holy Spirit who empowers us. When they said it's all among the prophets, God is sending a message that his Holy Spirit is empowering Saul. The first person in this passage to get a lot more than he expected was Saul. The second group of people to get more than they expected were the Israelites. And the third group of people to get more than they expected were the scoundrels. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some scoundrels said, how can this fellow save us? They despised him and they brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. Actually, they were right in a way. Saul can't save them. Only God can do that. In chapter 11, we then have really a continuation of the story to verify the kingship being given to Saul. There's this story that the, the Ammonites come and they besiege the city of Jabesh Gilead. Now the Ammonites from our Old Testament history, we know we're the descendants of Ammon, and Ammon was a son of Lot, meaning they are the great, 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 great grandnephews of Abraham. But this people, the Ammonites, had gone off into idol worship. They worshiped the god Molech instead of the god of Israel, and, and they practiced some very pagan practices like child sacrifice. 
And these people were also known for their cruelty. In fact, we read in the Old Testament what they would do to an expectant mother of a, of a people that they had conquered. And, and I won't get into the details. It's just too despicable and it's so horrible. But you just get a picture of these people and they besieged the city of Jabesh Gilead and the citizens of the city decide they're going to surrender and they're going to make a treaty with the Ammonites. So they asked the Ammonites if they can enter into some kind of surrender and peace treaty. And the head of the Ammonites responds back and says, yes, you can do it on one condition. We are going to put out the right eye of every single person in the city. And when you think about it, that has no military advantage to it. It has no political advantage. It's just an act of debasing an enemy. It is just simply trying to crush the spirit of these people. They were very cruel. Well, when word of what's going on in Jabesh Gilead comes to Saul, guess where Saul is? You would think that Saul would be sitting on his throne somewhere. He would be ruling over the kingdom, but instead he's out in the field plowing with his oxen. Saul just really didn't quite yet take this kingship thing seriously. He just went back to the field to work. And here he is in the field. He's plowing with his oxen. He hears this story about what's going on in Jabesh Gilead. And the scripture says, the spirit of God came upon him and he became angry. And Saul suddenly has the strength and the inner fortitude to do something about this injustice. He cuts up his oxen into various pieces and he sends messengers throughout Israel with the pieces of this oxen and deliver those to the various cities and places and tells the people of those places that if they don't come and fight for Israel, this is what's going to happen to their oxen. In other words, Saul issues a threat. You are either for us or you are against us. And it works. Saul amasses this army of 330,000 men. And they march to Jabesh Gilead where they encounter the Ammonites, Ammonites. And it is a complete victory for the Israelites. They totally rout the enemy. And then the response, which is really interesting, after the victory and they're celebrating, is some of the Israelites come to Saul and said, Do you remember those scoundrels? who didn't give you a gift, those scoundrels who questioned whether or not you could save us. How about if we put them to death? And Saul says, this is not a time to put anyone to death. This is a time of celebration. And Samuel holds a public celebration to recognize Saul as the rightful king of Israel. And of course, the lesson we learn from this story is God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, empowers us to do the impossible. Just imagine if we begin to understand and to live out the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, how it could transform our church, how it could transform form us as individuals. If we would quit depending upon our own strength and depend upon the power of the Holy Spirit, then we could actually begin to change the community around us. We could begin to change the world. We could begin to share the love, the grace, and the mercy of Jesus Christ and to share it with such power and such force that people will come to know Jesus Christ as their own Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can move mountains. 
through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do greater works. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can move the lives of others and touch them with God's love, God's grace, and God's mercy. And now truly, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Amen and amen.